Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Hello, and welcome to this Jungian life once again. And today we're going to deal with an altogether human phenomenon that I would certainly put uh, my chips down on that everyone has engaged in, and that is the issue of chronic complaining. Complaining that is chronic is like having a squeaky door uh, that never gets fixed but continues to bother us. It's not so serious often that it's really a disaster, but it keeps on coming back and keeps on coming back. And we seem to, in complaining chronically about the issue, lack the power or the authority to actually do something about it. It goes into the interpersonal realm. We need another person to listen to us. Complaining can range from being a real complaint of the soul to something that other people might consider pretty incidental. I'm aware of how good it can feel to complain. Mm. And, And that it can be this sort of oh, I don't know, you can just really revel in it. And it can kind of be a social sport. Complaining with other people can be a way of bonding. I'm thinking about maybe being in a relatively new situation with people that you don't know very well. It's It can be fairly simple to turn to the person next to you and complain about the weather or or some other, you know, deficiency in your environment. It can It can wind up being a point of connection with others that feels like an easy place to access. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, we all bond over problems, whether they're really big problems or fairly small ones, like the weather, like, oh, I know. Oh, this is, I think it's the sixth day, it's just poured down rain, uh, that there we are wired for a kind of connection there, meeting on this ground of ain't it awful. Yeah, I think that, finding a common moment that everyone can agree on. And, what, and that, of course, is happening in the political sphere, is you know a, a complaint will be uh, delivered and, the, and large swaths of people will gather around the complaint. You know, in the Vietnam, we shouldn't be at war. We should be at war. Call everybody back. You know, honor the military. The military is hurting people. You know, then any of these kind of topics causes people to kind of sort into camps and give them a sense of identity, whether that's at a a cocktail party or whether that's in a large swath of the environment. It's a really easy thing to do, isn't it? I'm I'm thinking about Psyche's sisters in the fairy tale of Psyche and Eros, where they sort of it's not exactly complaining, perhaps, but they really call into question the nature of Psyche's mysterious husband. They sort of natter on about it until Psyche's kind of faith in her husband is shaken and the tale goes on from there. But it reminds me of a dynamic that can uh, happen. And I'm going to say at the risk of incurring wrath, I think it happens particularly among women where we might sort of with some colleagues decide that there's a one person on on the staff who's really difficult to deal with. And so we start, at first it starts off as kind of just venting, but pretty soon we're in a habit. And this is the main way we connect with our colleagues is to complain about this other person and how that can just get really rigid. There's a triangulation that occurs or a displacement uh, for Psyche's sisters who are really terribly envious of their sisters good fortune and happiness, they displace it onto, oh my goodness, you know, you don't know who this guy really is. He could be uh, horrible and a monster, a horrible, great, ugly serpent. So the real feelings are avoided oftentimes or in those, you know, office dynamics that I think most of us have experienced. uh, You know, everybody can complain about the supervisor. 
So there's a way that something gets um, both touched on and avoided. It's put out there onto some other situation, problem, or person. As you were talking, I was thinking about how complaining can be a way of expressing envy by stripping value away from something, by highlighting just the negative. And I think that happens an awful lot. The first wife is envious of the second wife, and so then complaints are heaped upon as a way of devaluing this other person and allowing the first wife to feel that her self-esteem is intact. Right, so it gets it gets to be a way of kind of regulating our self-concept. You know, that when we complain about someone else, it kind of elevates us a little bit and kind of makes us feel a little bit better. And I think, Deb, going to your point, that also helps us to avoid a feeling underneath, a feeling of inadequacy or, or vulnerability, maybe. And owning our own shadow of your your example, Lisa, of Psyche's sisters, of their envy. Uh, and so they avoid that. You know, it's, I'm not having the problem. They will strip the value from their sister's happy marriage rather than say, oh my goodness, I have a shadow problem. I am envious. So then what part of what we're talking about is that in complaining, we need to wonder, we need to be wary lest we are projecting our shadow. Aha. Uh-huh. When we hear complaints, we might wonder, is there shadow projection going on? Are we doing that? Right. So the unacceptable part of ourselves is projected onto a situation or a person, and then we start landing a negative attitude, negative comments. Complaining is a way of distancing, take this away from me because it's just so awful. Right. It's not mine. It belongs to them. And of course, when we're dealing with projected shadow contents, these usually have a lot of emotional heat. And that would maybe explain some of the chronicity of complaining about them. We just kind of can't let it go. So there, there is a lack somewhere. The question is whether the lack is out there with this person or situation, or whether we might take a step back and say, maybe that lack is located in me. Maybe I need to make a change somewhere in my life or in my internal life, in my attitude, rather than putting it out there. But we can evacuate it, and it's safe if the problem is with my horrible uh, supervisor or the neighbor across the street. I'm just aware of how many different roles complaining can play, because I'm also thinking about when you're in a situation that's genuinely difficult and you're sort of venting. And is that useful or does that, you know, help keep us stuck? Or I think that's complicated. I think as therapists, we certainly see many clients come in and the initial complaint, uh, which a lot of times on intake forms, it'll even be language that way, you know, the initial complaint. So I think as we're starting the listening process, we're hearing how the ego of the client is framing the cause of their suffering. And then as psychoanalysts, we receive that, but over the weeks or months, we begin to be curious about what are the deeper tap roots that are trying to be expressed through the surface complaint. I'm still circling around this idea that there is a lack. You know, the comment of, it might be a very genuine lack due to a very, very difficult life circumstance, uh, and that the lack might be a, a lack of support, and that in the complaining, the person is requesting support and empathy and just some uh, companioning through the life crisis or difficult situation. Just because there's a lack doesn't mean that it lacks legitimacy. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about... Um... <laughs> I like to tell my kids that they are real champion complainers, both of them. <laughs> and and my daughter called me a couple of weeks ago when I was traveling. She called me and she said, hi, can I complain? And I said, sure, go ahead. She goes, I tried complaining to dad, but you know, he's just not a, as good at it as you are. And I said, well, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> and, you know, and she really just needed me to listen. And to, you know, and to sort of say, that sounds hard and, you know, oh, I can understand why that was upsetting. And she didn't, you know, she's very, she's very clear about what she wants and doesn't want. She doesn't want me to try to fix it. 
she doesn't want me to sort of jump on it either and kind of join with her in hating on whatever she's complaining about. That just kind of makes it worse. She just wants me to receive it. And I think that, you know, Deb, what you're talking about is some complaining is a request that our distress, whatever form it takes, just be received and heard. And that the intensity of the speaker then gets diminished. That as we complain about something, we're venting tension, affective ventilation. And then something in the nervous system quiets down, calms down. And then we feel that we can cope with the situation in a more rational Mm way. And that can be really helpful. And it can also sometimes, depending on the situation, if that's what, if that's how we're chronically dealing with it, is just by venting it, it may keep us from taking action. Yes. It becomes just a palliative of, I've let off some steam. So, ah, oh, good. I feel a lot better now. And then next week, I have to go back to the same person with the same issue and let off more steam. Uh, which brings in for me uh, the issue of how we feel when someone is complaining to us. The issue with your daughter of like, okay, you know, she knew she needed to complain and you said, okay, go ahead. I get the impression that it's kind of done. You know, it's not that other things won't come up, but that's what I needed and thanks a lot and I feel different now. Versus the same person who comes back with the same or similar complaints week after week. And we notice, oh no, you know, here he comes, here she comes. I got to put up with this uh, for another half hour and it never changes. So I'm very interested in the counter-transference like that with a friend or with a client. And one of the things that I will notice is with somebody who's a chronic complainer is that there's a feeling of helplessness in the individual And in the way that they're complaining, part of that helplessness is transferred onto the analyst or onto the friend, because anything that the friend suggests is um, dismissed. So I'll complain, let's say, and I won't allow you to help me or anybody else to help me. And then you become the helpless one because there's nothing you can do around my circumstance. And then there again is a sense of a relief in the complainer because now you're the helpless one and I'm the one who can leave the room and feel okay. Right. And so when we have a client, say, who does that, who comes in and complains week after week after week, and perhaps to us, it's fairly obvious that, you know, if certain actions were taken, the situation might change. But if we dare to make that suggestion or or even hint in that direction, it's just uh, brushed aside. And then, Joseph, like you're saying, we may feel helpless we may feel angry. One of the things that I might do in such a situation is just to reflect the feeling of helplessness. You know, it's like, well, that, you know, so for example, a client comes in and is complaining, you know, I don't, I don't understand why I can't lose weight. I don't eat that much or whatever. And then it comes out, comes, you know, it's revealed that the person is drinking, you know, five or six cans of Coke a day. (laughs) You know, it's like, well, did you think about perhaps cutting back on the Coke? Well, I couldn't do that. You know, I might say, well, well, this just feels like there's no easy answer, doesn't it? I might just say that. And that often the person, I think, having that sense of helplessness and hopelessness reflected back to them can feel very containing. So I think what we're starting to touch on is that another underlying factor in complaining can be a neurosis, uh, something that is one-sided and, in a way, an avoidance of true suffering. Uh, To take your hypothetical example of somebody that complains all the time about, I can't lose weight, but also I can't forego my my Coca-Cola during the day. The true suffering would be, wait a minute, what am I going to do? What would it be like to suffer forfeiting this amount of Coca-Cola or other soft drink or food substance? Then that would be the true suffering versus uh, the complaining that kind of lets some of the steam out of it, uh, but avoids the real problem and the suffering that would be entailed. And this goes to something that Jung wrote extensively about in his alchemical work in the calcinatio stage. 
that by frustrating the habitual behavior, the habitual response, that then something begins to heat up in the personality, which is deeper than the initial presentation. And then as people are wrestling and getting increasingly upset because they're not drinking their Coke or they're not doing some other behavior, people can often then land on much deeper feelings, images, and memories that are kind of connected. So for instance, with tremendous overeating issues, I will often uh, notice if it can be properly frustrated that there are tremendous maternal deprivations underneath it that are being compensated for by overeating or being overindulgent in one way or another. But that's not credible until people actually find it inside themselves. Right. And so there's this way that complaining that is not connected with a deeper soul lament may be a way of disconnecting from an underlying core emotion. And then we're just kind of spinning in this neurotic place where we're not actually suffering what is really going on underneath. I mean, I felt, and I would imagine listeners also will feel that when you mentioned, Joseph, an underlying history of maternal deprivation, uh, something in me just went right out, even though this is just, a, it's a hypothetical, not that it hasn't occurred, of like, oh, uh, now I have empathy. Now I start going, oh my goodness, uh, tell me more about that, about what your childhood was like, what your mother was like, how you experienced her, v versus the surface complaint of, well, I, you know, but I can't give up this substance or that soft drink. We know when it doesn't feel real and when the core issue and the real lack and true cause of suffering is being avoided and covered up. Yes, I think part of what you're saying, Deb, is our counter-transference to superficial complaints is often irritation. But when we can drop down into what's going on underneath, what's being avoided, mm -hmm. complaints are being used to avoid something deeper. And when we touch into that, we open into empathy. Right. So uh, a common complaint we hear in our offices is people coming in and complaining about their job. I think that happens frequently, or complaining about a boyfriend, girlfriend, a spouse. And it may take weeks or months for people to tolerate sifting down below the initial complaint to discover what really needs to be changed. For instance, something about their self-esteem, something about their access to feeling powerful enough to try something new, or perhaps some part of them that has a secret pleasure in the discomfort of the dynamic, because perhaps it reminds them, again, of an early childhood dynamic or something else that binds them to the repetition of the situation. But that sifting down process is what we're looking for and also encouraging the listeners to consider. Yeah, and, and when you talk about, you know, kind of what might bind us to a situation in which we chronically complain, I mean, one one of the things about complaining, the, the sort of other side of it in certain forms is it is being implied that we are right. So if we're complaining about something that someone else is doing, there's a sort of assumption somehow that that we're not doing that thing, that, that we're better than, or that we, we can see their faults. Uh, so there, there can be a kind of subtle superiority that comes along in complaining, not all the time, but that can be a sort of undercurrent. And that takes me back to the idea of neurosis, which for Jung was one-sidedness. And what you've just said, Lisa, is a perfect example of in complaining, I am right, my grievances are justified, the cause is external, and wait a minute, that's really one-sided uh, because I don't have to own the role that I play or the feelings that I'm avoiding in my chronic complaining. I'm thinking uh, back to what you said, Lisa, about the superiority as well. And I'm thinking about how complaining can also be a kind of status signaling. 
go to a really high end affair and you're sitting next to somebody and they're like, oh, those canopies, they're dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so complaining about the insufficiency of the environment suggests that I am I'm used to something that's so superior. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of related to the internet phenomenon of virtue signaling too, right? If you complain about what someone else is doing, you're saying, well, and look how virtuous I am. I'm not doing that thing. So status signaling, you know, I couldn't tolerate driving in a car that is just so low brow or et cetera, et cetera. Couldn't buy something off the rack. That's really funny. It reminds me of the st- of uh, Hans Christian Andersen's story, The Princess and the Pea. You know, she slept on, on 20 mattresses. And when she was asked the next day about, you know, how did you sleep? She said, oh, you know, I just, I, uh, it was awful. My bed was so lumpy and bumpy and bruised all over. It's like, well, you're very entitled and you're very special and your sensitivities are so remarkably um, high blown and aristocratic. It's like, really? Well, and then at the end of the fairy tale, the prince and the prince's mother say, oh, well, she must be princess material because she is, in fact, <laughs> so sensitive that only the finest things could possibly be tolerated. So you can imagine what it's like being married to her. <laughs> She's going to be super high maintenance. So there's a lot of entitlement that can go into complaining of, I'm entitled to extra special care. So let's visit the other side, though, because I think the fairy tale kind of takes us into that, because, of course, she, you know, she is special as evidenced by her ability to feel the pee through 20 mattresses. And there are times when we feel something very deeply or we need extra care. And I'm reminded I just read a really wonderful paper actually written by one of our listeners, Daniela Seif, has a wonderful uh, paper in a recent issue of Psychological Perspectives on the Death Mother. I just read it the other day, and one of the one of the pieces of research she she uh, refers to in this very well cited paper is um, this research about kind of fussy babies and the fact that they get more attention. And the hypothesis is that this is an evolutionary advantage because you know when when you know human beings were living among conditions where there often wasn't enough food, which was you know for much of our history the fussy babies were probably more likely to survive because they received more attention and nourishment. So there, there is something really positive about being a complainer about it's a, it's kind of feeling deserving of asking to be heard and to have our complaints listened to. Yes. And it's the old squeaky wheel gets the grease phenomenon. And there is real merit to that of if we voice our concerns, our needs, in a forthright way, the fussy baby, it's hard to ignore a baby that is crying, that there is something assertive that can be embedded in the complaining. I am having a problem. I need you to attend to it. I need help. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think there is, there, there's some real healthy ego in that, isn't there? You know, I, I would like to be listened to. I would like to be soothed. I would like to be attended to. And it's also located, I think a lot of this, although we've touched on what happens inside, is so located inherently in the interpersonal world. Complaining takes place between two or more people. It has to be voiced, whether it's the fussy baby or the princess and the pea or um, somebody who's unhappy with the canapes, like you mentioned, Joseph. But it's out there. It's interpersonal. And there is an implicit request for something from the other person. I think that I find myself more sympathetic to the idea of the fussy baby because the baby is absolutely dependent upon the goodwill and the resources of the parents. And of course, the baby's not choosing to be fussy or to be highly sensitive. When we get into the adult sphere and we start seeing people being uh, described as high maintenance, They have lots of needs and lots of demands from their loved ones, their spouses, the environment. You know, that that feels more complicated to me. And I wonder whether or not that is still a product of being an extremely sensitive being, being kind of a canary in the coal mine, or is that kind of a habit, a style of being in the world 
and an expectation that I will not meet my needs, but that other people will meet my needs. And that's a, that's a, can bite you in the butt, you know, many times. Yeah, there is a way that complaining is really, can be a real seeding of agency. I am helpless and all I can do is complain. You know, it, it reminds me of this really f- great internet video that we'll link to called It's Not About the Nail. <laughs> and maybe some of our listeners have seen it, but um, there's a woman complaining who has a, a problem that apparently will easily be fixed. And her her partner says, well, if we just did this, and she says, stop trying to fix it. I just want you to hear me. I kind of love the video because I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit ambivalent. You have, you have a lot of empathy for him, but you also have some empathy for her. She just wants to be listened to. And, and and so it seems to me like in complaining, what part of the, I think what we've been walking around is, where is it uh, sort of a necessary verbalization of something that just needs to be put out into the world, given uh, given voice, and where does that become? I'm sort of imposing this on you, looking to you to fix it. I'm in a kind of helpless stance. I think there's legitimacy to both. I think there is a a human need to have our suffering made visible, and whatever the nature of our suffering. And sometimes just being companioned in the suffering gives us a kind of strength, perhaps can give us a capacity to accept the reality and the truth of our suffering. Sometimes our grievances are legitimate that something could be improved. Let's say when we're working with couples in marital therapy, a lot of the work in one stage is each of the couple identifying what they feel to be legitimate grievances that have not been either verbalized or not been addressed. And so learning how to verbalize a, a grievance and having that received and some kind of a constructive agreement between the parties does allow the relationship to flourish. And, and even if the grievance may seem idiosyncratic on one person's part, it's still important to the person who's made the grievance. It seems to me there is a place where the wires get crossed all the time between the stated problem and the feelings around the problem. That the stated problem is... Um, you know, to come to your little example of the canapes, that these canapes are terrible. And I came to this party and I was hoping for some real treats and a good time and the food is really, really bad. So, okay, the stated problem is as if it is the canapes, but the underlying problem is I am disappointed. I needed a lift. I needed something good to happen. I was looking forward to some food treats and I'm feeling let down. And how we parse those two things in ourselves or when we listen to someone else complain is, is a tricky business. Just as you were saying that, Deb, I was, I was thinking about that internal state of chronic negativity, that mm. there's almost like a spirit in our psyche that is always orienting or often orienting negatively to whatever our vision falls upon. And some of that actually, strangely enough, can be related to early attachment dynamics. That people, for instance, who have ambivalent attachment, that I'm not happy if I'm close to mom, I'm not happy if I'm away from mom. You know, that that nothing is okay in the nervous system, and often because of real problems in early infancy. And then that becomes an atmosphere that nothing, nothing makes me feel better, and everything is just kind of shitty. Yeah, I, you know, as the mom of two complainers, um, <laughs> I, I totally agree, Joseph. And I think that there can be this other thing too that you know it's kind of that inner negativity that I think is a great point to bring into this topic can also be related to this you know one of these big five personality traits of being the trait neurosis. If you're high in the trait neurosis, then you you have that sort of inner tendency to maybe ruminate a little bit and that that can also you know kind of just maybe come from a more this is just how you came out 
in addition to what you're talking about, which I've also seen and is very real, is sort of uh, attachment lacks where you just don't expect good things from the world. You're just sort of always expecting the worst. So I think there's a range of things that can contribute to that, that certainly can give rise to a kind of complaining tendency and and it can also kind of become sort of self-sustaining because again it there's something comforting about complaining and something comforting about staying in that old story you know things never work out for me it's not in the other thing that never gets to perhaps a very early lack and it can't be verbalized if you were a baby if you were that fussy baby, perhaps, and it was very hard to be soothed, and then a toddler and a little one, before you have a memory that is accessible by ego, there is something there that becomes a way of self-soothing. You know, this is my litany of life is always hard. Good things don't happen to me. And it's very, very hard to get to the underlying issue, and then the initial problem perhaps of the fussy baby that can't be, be soothed, never gets identified. And even if it isn't identified theoretically, it may never change. I mean, it, it can be a spirit of suffering that has to be accepted as part of the companioning in this life. And part of that maturational dynamic is to identify our legitimate suffering and also to accept it. So let's just say somebody is born with an extremely sensitive nervous system or they had great deficits in infancy. You've done a long analysis. They know a lot about it. The next stage is to be able to say, I'm that person. So the next stage is taking responsibility uh, instead of ceding one's authority to as if the external world should meet that need. Is, it is located in me. This is my issue that I need to take conscious responsibility for. Yes, if I have the kind of nervous system that simply can never feel good, generally speaking, and I am in a state of deep knowledge about that, then as I work into most, walk into most situations, I'm not going to expect that situation to make me feel better. Because, because I am the kind of person who isn't going to be influenced that way. And then therefore, I need some other criteria by which to decide if something is valuable to me. Because deciding or putting something on a spectrum of it makes me feel better or worse. If we have an impaired um, assessment process in us, that's not going to work. So we have to also develop a different philosophy about how to evaluate uh, phenomena outside of ourselves. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about this Jung's idea of libido, by which he meant just sort of general life energy and, and thinking about it in terms of what you've both been talking about, which is sort of where do we kind of take responsibility for our distress and the way that a complaint can just be sort of empty or does it, do we take it in and some mysterious process happens where libido gathers around it and up to the point where we're ready to do something about it and there's energy to move out into the world and try to address it somehow? Yeah, that's really important, uh, Lisa. And I like the idea of energy gathering around it as if there's a pool of energy that can accrete in the psyche once we locate the problem within ourselves. That can be a benefit, I think, of complaining is it can be part of the process of helping us identify the problem. Yes, of there is distress going on inside the person who is complaining. And to get that refined and worded and identified and located, and then that person can say, okay, uh, this is my history or this is my pattern. This is how I tend to feel. This is what happens. And that's when I think energy can start to gather. Energy can start to form in the unconscious and the conscious of 
oh my gosh, um, how do I manage myself in this situation or around this issue or with this person? And then that's where action can start to take place. And it may be an altogether different kind of action from uh, just problem solving, uh, find the solution. It may be an internal shift so that something new that we haven't just thought of can begin to enter the space. And I like what you were saying in the beginning, Deb, which is we have to become suspicious of what we believe the causality is of our distress. Because the knee jerk is, I'm in a state of distress and that's happening in the vicinity of my spouse frowning. On a superficial level, we could attribute our distress to the facial expression of the spouse. And we might register that for a moment, but then to drop deeper and say, well, what if that wasn't the trigger? What if that isn't what's causing my distress? And leading down into a deeper kind of inquiry, which Jung, I think, said so eloquently when he wrote, at some point, we each have to ask this question, who am I such that this has happened to me? Who am I on the deepest levels? And if we really subscribe to Jung's idea of the unconscious and deeper to that, the collective unconscious, there is a way in which we individually co-participate with the constellation of all the events in our environment. So if that's true, on a deep, deep level, we drew that difficult spouse to us. We chose that uh, employer who we already knew on some level was going to be very difficult for us, and on and on. Now, it's one thing to, to simply just toss that out as a platitude, but to take that philosophy into oneself as a way of uh, assessing our difficulties and complaints, that allows a different kind of process to come forward. You know, I'm, I'm thinking kind of along those lines that it's important to take our complaints seriously, but perhaps not to take them at face value. I think there's a way that a complaint is often what starts us on a journey. You know, it's a recognition that we're unhappy with something that gets us into therapy or gets us to leave home or get a new job. And and so there's this way that it is often that which initiates us into our own story. You know, I, I think a little bit of... Um, you know, Oliver Twist, you know, he has to go up and say, please, sir, I want some more. And that starts him on his hero's journey. And of course, that's not exactly a complaint, but it is a, a sort of, he's sort of registering a lack. The complaint can often be what launches us. And it may not always, the thing that we think is wrong or the how we've located the distress or understood its origin may require a deeper look, too, if we're willing to do that. When we were talking about this earlier, Lisa, you had brought up that the activation of the self, this deep, authentic personality which can wake up or become more dynamic at a stage in life, can actually put us in a place of great malcontent, where all of a sudden our relationships, our job, our home, all these different things that normally seemed pleasing to us suddenly seem very out of sync with who we are becoming. And our sudden complaints or this phase of complaining is a, is a sign that the truer self is emerging. Right. So when we hear ourselves complaining, we might ask, where is this complaint coming from in the psyche? Is it kind of an ego complaint? And it's taking us away from a connection with our deeper self because we can just kind of stay in this ruminative stance. Or is something, is it a, is it an ex, a first expression of something that is kind of rising up from the depths? Mm -hmm. Something authentic, something that's saying this doesn't truly fit me anymore and that the the way this doesn't fit needs to come to crisis in order to mobilize a change, which I think uh, both of you were saying in terms of this accumulation of libido, 
around a particular issue that it comes to a, a place of such demand that we have to make a decision, make a change, even if it causes a massive reorganization of our lives. And we do, we see that all the time, actually. And that is hard to do. Those real life adjustments where we have to change uh, how we are, how we interact, the way we perceive ourselves in the world and relationships at work, whoa, that's big. <laughs> and I think uh, it's very human to kind of put that off for a while uh, with complaining. But all of a sudden, we have outgrown our old shoes. And where are the new ones? And what would they look like? And where do we need to go in our new shoes anyway? Those kinds of calls from deep within, uh, in the service of our individuation, are difficult calls to answer. We're really called into something unknown that's much bigger and deeper and more worthwhile, but hard to embrace. And on this note, it feels important to say that for some of us, we've really been taught to ignore our wants and needs. And we've been taught that it's wrong to ever complain. And, and for those of us who may be in that position, uh, listening to our complaints will be an important part of listening to our soul. And I'm, I'm thinking there's an image of this in the fairy tale, The Goose Girl, where uh, the goose girl, the, the, the heroine has been sent to marry a prince and along the way she's tricked by her uh, serving woman and who uh, exchanges clothes and exchanges places with her and the serving woman winds up marrying the prince and the princess winds up serving as a goose girl. And she uh, has no way to bring forward her story of uh, suffering. And, and it eventually tells her story to the stove and is over and it's overheard and then things are rectified. But it's like she, she you know, th this is an image of a psyche who felt unable to voice a complaint that's a different kind of stance toward complaining, that it can be important, as I was saying before, it's important to take our complaints seriously, but not literally. So in The Goose Girl, the fact that her complaints are clear enough that she can verbalize them and that she can put them into this fiery chamber, at least, and that process of translating it into language makes it more real for her and more real for the environment. One last bit, I, I just would love to say that every complaint, I think, secretly moves or leans towards a desire, but often that's not visible in the complaint. So for any of us that have complaints or for chronic complainers, it behooves us to look at our complaint and be able to say, this is what I would rather have, because it's in the seeding of your own psyche with where you want to go or this communication to the environment of what you want to have that things can mobilize. It's when we complain and we can't tell anyone what we would rather have that things become really stymied. Well, and I think that's a great way of putting it, that every complaint is sort of reaching toward a desire. And sometimes the desire is to be heard. And sometimes the desire is to evacuate our own sense of helplessness. And sometimes the desire is even to manipulate another. And sometimes the desire is to grow our souls, as in the case with the goose girl, where she can symbolically put her complaint into the fire and it is overheard by the king. So there is a sort of uh, elevated kind of spiritual, effective ruler power who then in the fairy tale rectifies the situation. But uh, symbolically, both of those things help her activate her desire through her complaint. And landing that in a very concrete way, you know, somebody comes in and says, no one ever listens to me. And so even translating that into, I want to be heard. Yes. And from that, 
declaration, if it's true for the person, then comes a series of demands for the complainer. How does one cultivate a style of speaking so that one is heard or received? How does one communicate and build a relationship such that people want to hear what we have to say and on and on and on? But it's in the declaration of what one wants that other things can move forward. Yeah, I think that's really valuable is uh, to flip it over, flip that coin over from tails to heads. What's not right turns into what do I want here? And then how do I get it starts to autom- kind of automatically ensue. How do I find people who will listen to me? What's going on here? Yeah, do I need to join Toastmasters so I actually can learn how to talk and, tell, and really talk in a way that people can hear me? You know, I mean, that may sound silly, but it's very pragmatic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. That you know, good. It might be important to complain, but then at some point, the complaint needs to be flipped to, and what would I like? Yeah. So what you're saying uh, here from a Jungian perspective is to find the telos, find where is this trying to go instead of it sort of being like the needle is stuck in this record in the groove over and over again. What's the next verse in your, in your life song? What do you want? Where are you going? Where is this trying to help you go? I think that's said perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> so with, with that, it may be time for us to move into a dream. Hi, this is Deb from this Jungian Life podcast. Joseph, Lisa, and I have been deeply moved by your response to our work, but producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Once again, please go to this jungianlife.com and click on Be Our Patron. Thank you. Today's dream uh, comes to us from a woman who is 36 years old and is an artist. And here's the dream. I was floating in the middle of the ocean and I had the impression that I was waiting to hear a lecture. There was a floating stage about 50 feet away from me. I noticed a few other people also floating near me waiting for the lecture to begin. Suddenly, I realized that I am not floating, but standing on something. I look down and I am standing on the fin of a blue whale. The whale is suspending itself perpendicularly in the water so that when I look down, we make eye contact. Upon looking in her eyes, I realize the whale is my mother. I am delighted by this. Immediately after the moment of warm recognition, she starts to gently submerge while I am still standing on her fin. I got the sense that she wanted me to accompany her to the depths, but I jump off instead. She senses my fear and rises up to meet me again, allowing me to continue standing on her fin. That was the end of the dream. For context, the dreamer says, I was in the middle of applying for grad school and feeling anxious about whether or not I even wanted to go back to school altogether. Uh, The feelings in the dream, the safety provided by the whale, but simultaneously fear towards the invitation to go underwater. And finally, the dreamer shares that one of my favorite stories has always been Jonah and the whale, not for any religious reason, but because of the idea of being swallowed by a whale filled me with the sublime the simultaneous feeling of awe and terror 
As a child, I had dreams of being pursued by a whale on land. I was never swallowed, but the dreams felt nightmarish. This current dream felt entirely different. There was warmth in the dream, for lack of a better description. There was a peace in this entire setting. When I recognized the whale was my mother, I felt deep mutual love. It seems to me that something very important has happened for the dreamer through this dream. I find myself meditating just on that transition from floating to standing on the whale. I'm just imagining it almost like a little, you know, animation in my mind, and then trying to associate to that the various things that that could signal in terms of a change or a maturational change in the psyche. When I think of clients who have a floating quality or who, who complain that they feel untethered to the environment, I think of people who are moving through the world and the world doesn't seem quite real to them. Perhaps the consequences don't seem quite engaging and real to them, that they don't feel deeply or fully invested in what they're doing or receiving from life or the relationships that they have. And on a more serious note, there is this phenomena we call a schizoid character trait, where people often because of early troubles learn how to float into a kind of internal world. So they only have about one foot in their external world, and the other foot is chronically in a kind of dreamy, protected internal state. And then the power of the whale, the mother, the self, which are often combined, particularly in the early stages of work, coming to begin a reparative process to give the ego uh, a temporary place to stand with which to orient to the world and, since they're in a lecture hall, perhaps to orient to this idea of continuing the education, orient towards the use of that thinking function, perhaps, and that it's a temporary platform that the whale's not going to exist simply to act as a platform for the ego, but that it will have to return on its own independent journey. So this is a transitional opportunity, it sounds like, for the ego. What I'm aware of most in this dream is my own feeling of being substantially moved. This beautiful image of a whale which seems to me to be an image of the self with a capital S uh, and the mother archetype, uh, but this beautiful image of connection and support in real contrast uh, to the dreamer's experiences as a child with whale images. A, a really numinous experience has occurred in this dream. This is a real gift I think, from deeper levels of the psyche. And the dreamer, the dream ego, is delighted. She has a moment of warm recognition. And as you mentioned, Joseph, then the, the whale, the self, can go back to its depths in the psyche, in the ocean, literally, but in the psyche. And the dream ego can journey on back into her own realm on the land. But a very important connection has been made that's, to my mind, not subject to simply interpretation. This was an experience, and the dreamer knows the experience. It's a memory at this point, and it lives in her psyche. I'm sort of sharing your reaction, Deb, but I'm, I'm wanting to kind of knit it into the, the setting of the dream. And this is pretty unusual to be floating in the ocean waiting to hear a lecture. You know, that's a, <laughs> that's a very incongruous image in some way. And so, and it does perhaps seem to touch on graduate school. You know, what do you do at graduate school? You, you know, you often go to lectures, you know. And somehow this is a lecture hall or lecture platform out at sea that's floating itself. 
And and I was thinking as I was reading the dream, what would it be like to be floating in the ocean waiting to hear a lecture? What would it be like to float to hear a lecture? I, I think I would I, I think I would feel a little vulnerable. There's some contrast, I think, between the sort of lecture imagery and this whale. What's going on on the lecture stage really pales in comparison to the significance of the experience with the whale. So it reminds me, first of all, um, I too have had multiple um, numinous dreams since childhood about whales, some of which were very frightening, but but they had the similar quality of of really being about something that's clearly just so much bigger, bigger than ego. And that is, that is, there is something terrifying about that. I mean, it is both terrifying and uh, awe-inspiring, I think, an encounter with a whale. And I'm reminded, um, Joseph Campbell talks about, I think, the, I think it's, I believe it's a Maori expression. They say, we are standing on the back of a whale harpooning minnows. What he says about this is that we are standing on a whale. The ground of being is the ground of our being. And the outward turn, we see all these little problems here, but inward, we are the source of them all. That's the big mystical teaching. So, and I, I love that image that we're all standing on a whale trying to harpoon a minnow. And I think it relates, you know, she thinks she's there for the lecture. But the lecture's like the minnow. Really, she's there for the encounter with the whale. That's really lovely, and it's right on point, Lisa. That's a great contribution. And I'm also contrasting her anxiety about her encounters with whales as a child and her anxiety about grad school with this encounter with the whale. Uh, that's right. You're, you're there for the whale. Uh, something something bigger is going on yeah, and here. You know, and it's not going on on the surface of the water. Yes. And the promise that the whale could be encountered, uh, perhaps even through returning to grad school, can make a person very ambivalent about it. I remember reading in James Hillman's biography how in his youth he hated writing. I mean, he had this incredible <laughs> uh, feeling against it. And later in his life, upon reflection, he felt that the magnitude of what would awaken in him as a writer was so huge that it was that it was awful for him to approach it as a young person. That it was only as he matured could he tolerate what I would, might say is the encounter with his whale by taking up that part of his nature. So I wonder, applying it here, that the artist returning back to school might hold the promise of such a substantial experience that uh, one has to gasp a little bit before you take the plunge. Mm -hmm. And we have to be ready to have an encounter with these whales, uh, with ourselves, of something big, whether it was writing for Hillman and writing about big ideas, or going to graduate school and embracing a path of study and perhaps work that's big, and that ego has to be ready to hold its own in the encounter with this mythical whale. We are out in the depths. Yes, you know? exactly. It's now I'm now I'm thinking of Joseph. Your your what you brought up has really shifted it for me a little bit. It's like this is an interesting setting for a lecture. You are out in the depths, you know? So it I, makes me wonder the quality of the experience she might be anticipating and whether it really is leading her into deeper waters that might perhaps seem frightening, but also promising. Part of the perhaps anxiety around the decision may have to do with the inscrutable level of the whale, that the dream ego decides this is my mother, we're looking in each other's eyes, that it is returning to support me as I flounder. That's one possibility. But the whale in the unconscious also has its own inscrutable agenda that cannot be fully understood by the ego, nor predicted by the ego. So that adds another bit of a gasp factor 
mm. you know, mm. to the whole right. process. Right. And imagining it as explicitly beneficent can be kind of a self-comforting move. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're right, and I think there is something essentially, um, you know, deeply comforting about this particular image. But I think you're right in raising that, and you know, even the dream. It's like, but how deep does it go? Yeah, it's comforting when it's right here, but now the call is to surrender and go under. And where would that take me? There was a news piece, maybe in the New York Times magazine section, probably about 10 years ago, about uh, some people who had been involved in rescuing a whale who had gotten caught in some lines. And they, you know, had to kind of saw away at the ropes or whatever. And it was a, it was a huge whale. And this, this uh, person was talking about looking into the whale's eye as he or she worked on this and just how incredibly numinous that was. I don't know that that word was used, but it's this, it's a real encounter with something other. And I think I really feel that in this dream too. What the, what the person in that article, I remember it because I, I clipped it. Uh, I was so touched. And what he said was that the whale could have thrashed its tail uh, at any time, but did not. And that as he was cutting the ropes away from the whale's face and near the whale's eye, he could see the eye and the eye looked back at him and what he said later was, I will never be the same. Oh. Mm. And I think this dream has some of that quality of mm -hmm. the whale senses my fear and rises up to meet me again, allowing me to continue standing on her fin of that, that support while one is in the depths of having a connection to a creature of the deeps but being able to stand, a uh, sort of uh, a classic sort of egoic position. And isn't that what we want, a right relationship with psyche, to be ourselves, to be upright, to stand and have a connection with the depths and f feel both connected and separate, both consciousness and ego and the unconscious and the depths that the ocean always symbolizes. It's a lovely image. I have to say that it's lovely and it's ambivalent if we don't um, become too idealizing of it in as much as, you know, there's a part of her in the dream that feels like this is really happening. And if she were to descend with the whale, she would not survive that. Um, she starts to gently submerge while I stand at her fin. I get the sense that she wants me to accompany her to the depths. I jump off instead. And that's actually a moment, I think, of wisdom in the ego's standpoint. And it speaks to a developmental process that also may be happening in her, is when we think of the structure of the psyche, it's the anima animus that can go to the depths and return safely and provide experiences of the collective unconscious that the ego would not be able to withstand directly. But what happens is, the end is she senses my fear and rises up to meet me again, allowing me to continue standing on her fin. That's the ending, the lysis, the resolution is, is not the submerging. It's not the either or, but, but this, uh, this image that I um, resonated to uh, so positively before and still do. Yeah, yes. You know, I, I understand how, how gratifying it is. But there is a developmental process that if she can constellate a, a clear animus, that she actually can go back to school, that she could find a firm stance in the world and doesn't have to feel like she's tide tossed in the ocean, and that she could safely, some aspect of her, could go to the depths with the whale, and that's not in place. And so, like you say, something in the self is supporting her to keep her head above water so that the ego doesn't get exhausted and then drown in something, which would be a problem. So she's being kept safe, but yet a transition needs to happen because standing on the fin of a whale is also not a sustainable place. 
That's a really interesting take on it, Joseph. And I, I admit I was at first resistant to it, but I, I think that's an interesting point. I mean, it again, it goes back to this, like the middle of the ocean is not a good place for a lecture. Middle and, of the ocean is a scary place. Yeah, yes, it is. And so here, here is my kind of thought about it. For some reason, I keep on thinking of the the biblical expression, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. And this idea that we we sort of have to do the quotidian daily grunt work, you know. So I think that perhaps, for example, if going back to graduate school is going to create for her an opportunity to confront her whale, a la your questioning about, about Hillman, um, then, you know, you, you, you need a sort of firm grounding around that. Like you, you need to be able to write the papers and buy the textbooks and, and pay your rent and, and, and do that kind of stuff too, in order to have the kind of grounding to be able to have that encounter with God or the whale. It's sort of a both and. I'm, I'm still in a somewhat different place. I, the dream is enough. Of course there's more. There's always yes. more. Yes. Of course there's more. She's a young woman. <laughs> She's going to go to grad school. You know, this dream doesn't really say anything much about animus and textbooks and all the rest <laughs> of it. It's a connection. Something has come alive that is supporting her. And it's a nice, beautiful image of, of a deep connection with her being able to maintain ego position. And there's the dream uh, w- without venturing into, you know, what, what her developmental stages and quotidian tasks are going to be. It's encouraging. It's positive, And it's a very special dream. It is. I, I agree with you too, Deb. We can all agree with that. Okay. Time to stop for today. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.